Well, welcome everybody. This teaching is about energy. It's about an unseen element that you and I emit on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. That every cell in the body is emitting light and information. And the more orderly, the more coherent, the more cadence and rhythm there is to frequency, the stronger the signal that can carry information. And there are elements and things in our lives that disrupt and break down that energy. And in a sense, then, we begin to execute less effects on our lives. And without that energy, the body breaks down, the brain slows down, the immune system no longer regulates, the digestive system no longer functions, and we become materialists, kind of living life as matter, trying to change matter. And whenever we're living in matter trying to change matter, the effect is that things that we want in our lives take an enormous amount of time. And over the years, we have done so much scientific studies and measurements on the brain, on the heart, on gene expression, on immune regulation, on the energy that's emitted from the body, the energy that's emitted in a room when a group of people come together and they have coherent energy. We've measured telomeres. If your cells can actually rejuvenate and you can elongate your life by applying a certain formula that we discovered in the process. And we only started to study all of these phenomenological things is because we started witnessing in a week-long event people stepping out of wheelchairs, reversal of health conditions. There was dramatic changes going on in a person in real time. And if we can witness some type of change in a person in real time, all of a sudden it's less that matter is influencing matter, but in some way energy is influencing matter. Now you can't really talk a lot about energy to scientists, but when you started seeing really important changes in the brain and the heart, so much so that some of the scientists that were doing the studies thought that there was something wrong because the amount of changes in energy in the brain and the heart were outside of normal. But when we talked to the people and interviewed them, we were seeing very specific objective changes that somehow started to be a trend. We started seeing it with more and more people. But the subjective experience that they had was profound. Somehow they had a very profound internal experience that was as real or more real than their own past, their shock, their betrayal, their loss. And in some instant, their body, in a matter of seconds, began to respond to energy, to a new mind. And the stories that were told were so profound that we really started to understand that a couple things. They couldn't make their brain do that. In a sense, it was happening to them. And when we saw those kind of changes where they had sustained energy, <clears throat> and it was one person after the next after the next, the experience somehow changed the way that they viewed their lives. And it was some type of mystical moment, some type of interface between energy and matter that we started to discover. And so I now know that there is a formula, an understanding that if once applied, if the person can learn it no different than a golf swing or learning how to dance a certain move, learning how to crochet or knit, in time it becomes a habit or a skill. We started seeing people in time with practice, being able to execute on command. In other words, we could say to them, can you do this? And in effect, they were able to do it. Now, anything that is repeatable then becomes more scientifically studyable. You can, you can measure it on a consistent basis. Something happens once, that's called an incident. Something happens twice, it's called a coincidence. When it starts happening over and over and over again, now you're looking at a trend, something that's repeatable is science. 
So if we give people sound scientific information, and as I've always said, science is the language of mysticism. It is science that demystifies the mystical. And as they learn that information, and if they're present and they can pay attention to it, they begin to add new stitches into the three-dimensional tapestry of their gray matter. That, in fact, learning is making those synaptic connections. And just a little bit of practice, a little bit of study, a little bit of repetition, for just an hour, you can double the number of connections in your brain. So if learning is making new connections, then remembering is maintaining and sustaining them. And as we build a model of understanding and we combine quantum physics with neuroscience, with neuroendocrinology, with psychoneuroimmunology, with epigenetics, a person can begin to build a model of understanding. The next step is that they have to be able to explain it. If they can't explain it, it's not wired in their brain, but if they can explain it, they begin to install the neurological hardware in preparation for the experience. And if the scientific model is complete enough that nothing is left to conjecture, nothing is left to superstition, nothing is left to dogma, they understand exactly what they're doing and why. The more we understand the what and the why, the how will get easier because we can assign meaning to what we're doing. So then if we can set up the conditions in an environment and people feel safe enough to practice, if they can get their behaviors to match their intentions, they can get their actions equal to their thoughts, they can unlearn certain habits that of thought, of behavior, of emotions, and begin to practice in time when they align their thoughts and feelings, when they align their mind and body, they are going to have a new experience. Now, the experience then causes more neurons to begin to organize into networks, into patterns, and the moment those neurons string into place, the brain makes a chemical, and that chemical is called a feeling or an emotion. When people begin to embody the emotion from an experience, they are teaching their body chemically to understand what their mind is intellectually understood. So the payoff from an experience is an emotion, and it feeds the body. So in time, the, bo the body begins to change because the research in genes says that it's not the environment is signaling the gene, but the end product of the experience in an environment is an emotion, that they are actually changing their genetic future by having a new experience because it's new information coming from the environment. And it's not the gene that creates disease, it's the environment over time. And the redundancy of the same emotions, doing the same things, creating the same experiences, keeps the person the same. And genes make proteins, and in time, if a person is stuck in the same emotional state, the genes begin to wear out. And now they're headed for that same genetic destiny they, that they inherited. But the new experience then producing the new emotion, the signal from the environment, begins to select and instruct new genes, and it changes a person's future. The question is, if you've done it once, you should be able to do it again. And if you can repeat any experience over and over again, you're going to neurochemically condition the mind and body to begin to work as one. When you've done something so many times that your body now knows how to do it, as well as your conscious mind, now it's innate in you. Now it's second nature. Now it's easy. Now it's familiar. It's more automatic. You begin to master that knowledge, and you begin to move into a new state of being. So then, our job then is to go from philosopher to initiate to master, from knowledge to experience to wisdom, from mind to body to soul, from thinking to doing to being, to learning it with your head, applying it with your hands, and knowing it by heart. And you and I have all the biological and neurological machinery to do this. And this is a time in history where it's not enough to know. This is a time in history to know how. How many people are with me? So we are retreating from our lives, in a sense, and we are removing the constant information that's bombarding us from the people we know, the things we do, the places we go, the news, the same experiences that produce the same emotional reactions. 
and we become victimized by the circumstances in our lives. And when things go really well, we feel good because the environment is telling us that things are okay. And in a sense, we're victims to how the environment dictates our responses. So if things go well and you feel good, then the environment is controlling your feelings and thoughts. But if things don't look good, then of course your response to the environment causes you to feel bad or unhappy. And your reactions to different circumstances in your life causing you to feel unhappy, and you say it's that circumstance or that person or that situation that's making me feel this way. In a very real sense then that we are victims to our environment. And it's the response to the environment over time that begins to weaken the body. And we become more vulnerable to the environment. And the stronger the emotions that we feel to some person or some problem in our life, the more we put our attention on it. And where we place our attention is where we place our energy. And we give our power away to create to that person or that circumstance. And yet, we're discovering that the way you think and the way you feel has an effect on your environment. So if you're responding in the same way to the same circumstances in your life, and those same circumstances are causing you to feel the same way and think the same way, then you're thinking and feeling equal to everything that you know. And now you keep reaffirming or recreating the same environment. How many people understand? Does that make sense? So then, every person, every object, every thing, every experience is already mapped neurologically in your brain because you've experienced every person, every object, everything, every place. And everything that's known to you is stored in your thinking neocortex. You also have an emotion associated to every person or object or thing or place. And so then when you react to someone based on your memory of the past, and you cannot think greater than how you feel, if you believe that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny, then you are thinking in the past, and you will create more of the same in your life. How many people are with me still? So then, most people wake up in the morning, and they start off by thinking about their problems. And those problems are memories that are etched in the brain that are connected to certain people, certain objects, certain things at certain times and places. And the moment they start remembering their problems, are they thinking in the future or are they thinking in the past? And because every one of those problems has an emotion associated with it, now their body's in the past because thoughts are the language of the brain and feelings are the language of the body. And how you think and how you feel creates your state of being. So most people start their day with their entire state of being in the past. And if they remember the feeling of unhappiness and that unhappiness drives certain thoughts, and, the, and then the, those thoughts produce certain chemicals for them to make more, them feel more unhappy, and then the brain checks in with the body and says, yeah, you're really miserable, and you generate more corresponding thoughts equal to those feelings, you're firing and wiring the same circuits in the same way, hardwiring your brain into a set of automatic programs. And the body is so objective that it does not know the difference between the real life experience that's creating the emotion and the emotion that person is fabricating by thought alone. The body is believing it's in the same past experience 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Now the person is locked into a familiar state of being and it only takes a thought and a feeling, a memory and an emotion, a stimulus and response that begins to condition the body emotionally into the past. Now when it comes time to change, the person has to change the brain and the body to step out of the familiar past. But then they wake up and they get out of bed and they run through the same routine behaviors they did the day before. And they move about in the same habitat, the same environment, doing the exact same things. And over time, their body goes on autopilot. And a habit is a redundant set of automatic 
unconscious thoughts, behaviors, and emotions that's acquired through repetition. The habit is when you've done something so many times, now your body now knows how to do it better than your conscious mind. And the body then is dragging a person into the same future based on what they did in the past. And you can take their yesterday and set it on their tomorrow. And they've lost their free will to create to a series of programs. And by the time we're 35 years old, we've memorized a set of behaviors, emotional reactions, unconscious habits, hardwired beliefs, perceptions, and attitudes that function just like a program. Once it starts, it runs automatically. So the process of change then is not thinking positively because the person has programs that cause them to feel negative. And the thought never changes the body. So if the familiar past is the known and the predictable future is the known, then there's only one place left where the unknown exists, and that's the sweet spot of the generous present moment. And teaching people how to disinvest their attention and energy out of the predictable future and back into the present moment and break the conditioning process where we keep returning back to the emotions that reaffirm who we are based on the past takes a great amount of energy and a great amount of awareness. And that's exactly what all of you are doing. Are you with me still? So if the body is afraid of the unknown because the hormones of stress say that it's best to run from the unknown, you have better chances of surviving if you hear something in the bushes moving around and you pause and you freeze and there's a rush of adrenaline and you narrow your focus on the cause, that unknown in the bushes is better for you to back up and run away than to face off with it. And so we've been primed over time for thousands of years that the unknown is a scary place. And so then, by thinking the same thoughts, by making the same choices, by doing the same things that create the same experiences that produce the same feelings and emotions in time, and those emotions begin to influence your very same thoughts, causes our biology to stay exactly the same. And so we afford people new information, new knowledge, new understandings, new philosophy, new theory, and we inspire them to make new choices, to begin to do new things and break the old habit and relearn, to create new experiences and produce new emotions. And in just a matter of four days, people begin to upregulate genes that begin to heal their body and change the way their body functions just by changing the way they think, changing the way they act, and changing the way they feel. The problem is, is that the brain and body locked into the past, clinging to the known and familiar, where the body has been conditioned to be the mind. The moment a person decides to do something differently or make a different choice, they feel uncomfortable because they've left the known and they've left the familiar. And if the body has been conditioned to be the mind, the animal, the servant, is now the master. And it wants to return back to familiar territory. And as we step out into the unknown and we feel that discomfort, the uncertainty, not being able to predict the next moment, the body begins to influence the mind. And we start to hear the same thoughts. And if we respond to that thought that's hardwired in the brain and we accept it, we believe it, we surrender to it without saying, is this the truth? That same thought leads to the same choice, which leads to the same behavior, which creates the same experience and produces the same feeling and the same emotion. And the person says, this feels right to me. But all it is is that it feels familiar. And so the process of change then is to become conscious of your unconscious thoughts. And the more conscious you become of your unconscious thoughts, the less you will go unconscious to them in your waking day. How many people in this audience have run up against a few thoughts this week that are standing in the way between you and your dreams? Yes or no? 
Now, most people would rather turn on their cell phones or turn on the TV or get on Facebook or do something to distract themselves from those thoughts that are literally subconscious programs that are influencing so much of the behaviors and choices. How many people in this audience have come up against themselves and noticed that they wanted to complain and make excuses and feel sorry for themselves and judge other people and you all of a sudden became aware that you were doing that? How many people noticed that? If you notice that, then you can't be unconscious. And now the moment you become more familiar with or more conscious of those behaviors, the less you are a program and more you are the consciousness of observing the program. And it's only when we forget and not remember and go unconscious that we're back into those programs. How many people here in this audience have come up against an emotion of agitation, of frustration, of impatience? How many people have felt anger and frustration and all those emotions? They have to come up because those emotions are keeping a person anchored to the past. And the fundamental question is, do these emotions belong in my future? So if you want to be an abundant person, you can't feel lack. If you want to master your health or some health condition, you can't be in, in separation or pain. And so disentangling from the past emotionally, disentangling from the programs of our hardwired thoughts and behaviors takes a tremendous amount of effort and a tremendous amount of work. And if your personality creates your personal reality, and it does, and you begin to denature the personality in its fundamental sense, and stepping out into the unknown, is it possible then to think about a new way of thinking? and fire and wire new thoughts in your brain. And with intention and with presence and attention, you begin to install new circuits. And if you keep repeating it over and over again, that hardware begins to become more like a software program and you automatically install a new thought that says, I am unlimited, it is possible. Synchronicities do happen in my life. I am worthy to receive. If you decided to start your day and think about how you were going to be in your think box of your day, and you begin to review your behaviors, if you begin to rehearse how you're going to be with your children, at work, while you're in traffic, and you can be truly present in that process, your brain will not know the difference between what's going on out there and what's going on in here, in the present moment and the imagination begins to install the circuits to look like you've already done it. Now the brain is no longer in the past, you are priming the brain into the future. And by installing those circuits and rehearsing it over and over again, the hardware becomes a software program and it's more automatic and the next thing you know, you start acting like a happy person. There's no magic there, you've installed the circuits. How many people are with me? So then, the hardest part of this whole process is to change the way we feel. That means then, most people who are working on manifesting something, something in their life, they're waiting for the experience to occur. And that experience, when it does occur, whether it's their health, their wealth, their new relationship, the mystical experience, they're anticipating the feeling of what it would feel like but they're waiting for their environment to change, for the experience to happen, to feel the emotion. So in a sense then, they're separate from the feeling and they're separate from the experience and they're in lack, waiting for the outer environment to change, to take away their emptiness or lack. And they forgot that they're creating reality. And their lack then is keeping their dreams at arm's length. How many people are with me? That's living by cause and effect. But the moment you start feeling gratitude and wholeness, your healing begins. The moment you start feeling worthy and abundant, you are generating wealth. The moment you walk in a state of empowerment, you are walking towards your success. The moment you are in love with life and love with yourself, you create a vibrational match. 
The moment you're in awe of life, you are going to have a mystical experience, and now you are causing an effect. Are you with me still? So then, we now know that if people want to change their state of being, all they have to do is marry a clear intention of the future combined with an elevated emotion. And just like remembering the past, the stronger the emotion that we have to some problem, some event in our life, the more altered we feel inside of us, the more we narrow our focus on the cause in the outer environment, and the brain takes a series of snapshots, and that's called a long-term memory. And people think neurologically within the circuits of those experiences, and they feel within the boundaries of those emotions. The stronger the emotion we feel from some future event, the more altered we can change our internal state, the more we will pay attention to the pictures in our mind. And now we are branding that event neurologically in the brain, and we will think neurologically within the circuits of that experience and feel emotionally within the boundaries of that future. And the stronger the emotion you feel connected with that clear intention, the more your body is getting a taste emotionally of the future. And it only takes a thought and a feeling, a memory and emotion, a stimulus and response to begin to condition the body emotionally into the future. And I now know that when people get up from their meditations and they feel the emotions of their future, they're no longer separate from it. Why would they look for it if they feel like it's already happened? Are you with me still? And their job then is to think and feel in that state with their eyes open and maintain that modified state of mind and body their entire day, independent of the conditions in their environment, independent of the habits and the conditioning emotionally in the body, and independent of time. And if they're able to do that properly and maintain that state of being, they start to see these synchronicities these opportunities, these coincidences that begin to happen in their life because they're in a different state of being. How many people are with me? So then, if it takes a clear intention and an elevated emotion to change our state of being, and we begin to react to someone or something in our lives, and we lose the feeling, and we say it's that person or that circumstance, we're back to the unconscious program of being a victim in our lives, and we just disconnected from the energy of our future, and now we are back to the energy of our past. Are you with me still? And nothing should change in our lives because we're in the same energy. So then are emotions bad? Emotions are the end product of past experiences. And a person is living by the same emotions every single day then. Their emotions are keeping them anchored to the past. Elevated emotions, then, we use as fuel to drive us into a new future. And so then, when we started studying, what would it take to marry a clear intention with an elevated emotion? And we started looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of people's brains. We started to see that most people's brains weren't working well. And when their brains aren't working well, they're not working well. We started noticing that most people could not feel an elevated emotion because they were too busy living in stress and living in survival. And living in stress is living in survival. And living in stress is when your response to the environment causes you to activate the autonomic nervous system. And when you activate that autonomic nervous system, a branch of it called the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight nervous system, is mobilizing all of the body's energy, all of the body's resources for some danger in the outer environment. Are you with me still? And it mobilizes all this energy to prepare the body to do one of three things, to fight, to run, or to freeze and hide. And so the mobilization and tapping all of the body's resources causes the heart to race, respiratory rate to increase, pupils to dilate, digestive juices to shut down, blood sent to the extremities, the immune system dials up, then dials down. We mobilize all this glucose 
to have the energy to be able to run, fight, or hide. Now, in the short term, that works really well. All organisms in nature can tolerate short-term stress. The human beings were a little bit more complex. Sometimes it's not the predator that we're afraid of, it's the person sitting next to us at work. Sometimes it's the news. Sometimes it's a reaction to someone or something. And the constant knocking the brain and body out of balance causes that imbalance to become a new balance, and now the person is headed for some type of breakdown, some type of disease because no organism can live in that state, an emergency state, for an extended period of time. Are you with me still? So then, when there is a rush of the stress hormones, and the person now is perceiving a danger, they have the perception that something's getting, going to be worse in their life, they can't control the situation, they can't predict what's happening, they're in the unknown, that response heightens the senses and it causes us to narrow our focus on the particle in quantum physics, on everything material, because that's where the danger is. And the rush of those chemicals draws from this invisible field of light and information that our cells are emitting, and we're tapping those resources and turning it into chemistry. And the field around our body shrinks. We become a little bit more matter, a little less energy. And we can turn on the stress response just by thought alone. And people use those rush of those chemicals combined with the thought to give them a rush of energy. And in time, their thoughts begin to make them sick. And so then if your thoughts can make you sick, is it possible that your thoughts could make you well? We're learning that. So then in that state where the person is experiencing a loss of control, the perception that something's getting worse, they can't, they can't predict what's going to happen in the next moment, <clears throat> we begin to try to control everything in our life, in our mind. We shift our attention to one person, to another person, to another thing to do, another place we have to go, another chore we have to do, another person we have to call, and every single person, every single object, every single thing has a neurological network in the brain, and the arousal of the stress hormones drives the brain into a brainwave pattern called high beta brainwave patterns. And those high beta brainwave patterns cause us to become overly focused on the environment, overly focused on ourselves, overly focused on our problems, overly focused on time. We obsess about time. And all of our attention is on the body, on the environment, and time. And so now, where we place our attention is where we place our energy. And if all of our attention is on the environment, on our body, and in time, then all of our energy is invested in this three-dimensional reality. And we, when we feel more like matter and less like energy, more like particle, less like wave, and we're shifting our attention to all these different elements, the arousal of those hormones causes different compartments of the brain to begin to fire out of order. And the habituation of doing this begins to compartmentalize the brain. And like a lightning storm in the clouds, the brain begins to fire very incoherently. When the brain is incoherent or disintegrated, we're incoherent. How many people understand? So then, people get stuck in these beta brainwave patterns, these high beta brainwave patterns. And because the arousal of those stress hormones keeps them in the state, and they're narrowing their focus and shifting their attention on everything physical, everything known, everything that's wired in their brain, and they are afraid of the unknown, they would rather cling to their unhappiness. They would rather cling to their pain. They would rather cling to their unworthiness, their sadness, because it's familiar than take a chance and possibility. And the arousal of those hormones creates the emotions of anger, and frustration, and impatience, and hatred, violence, competition, fear, anxiety, worry, envy, jealousy, insecure, insecurity, pain, suffering, guilt, shame, depression. Those are all created from the hormones of stress. And psychology calls those normal human states of consciousness. They are altered states of consciousness. Are you with me still? And the heart. 
all of a sudden when we react and respond and we're in traffic and we can't go anywhere and we are late for a meeting and all of a sudden the adrenaline is rushed into the body and the heart is racing and you're sitting in your car and you're not using that energy to run, fight, or hide, and the frustration and the impatience and all those emotions causes the heart to begin to beat in a very arrhythmic pattern. The heart becomes incoherent. And now, energy leaves the heart and energy leaves the brain and our field around our body shrinks and now we feel separate from energy, separate from the field. In fact, it's not a time to create. It's not a time to learn. It's not a time to meditate. It's not a time to go in, inward, because the survival gene when activated says going inward would make you pray. Going inward would cause you to take your attention off the environment. There's just too much danger. There's too much stimulation out there to go within. How many people are with me? And how many people here have felt that arousal during a meditation where you were doing nothing but sitting still? That's because the body is looking for something and every time you settle it back down into the present moment, you are executing a will that's greater than one of those programs. Every time you bring the body from the emotions of the past back into the present moment, you are retraining it. You are reconditioning it to a new mind. And if you keep practicing it in time, the body starts to trust us and it moves more into the present moment. Are you with me still? So then, we started to look to see in all these different brains we were studying in real time. Some people in their meditation, their brains were actually getting worse. And we wanted to know what was going on when we asked them, what are you doing in there? Most of the time, they were overthinking, overanalyzing, consistently obsessing about some problem in their life, trying to figure out an answer, trying to analyze a solution. But they were analyzing that solution within some disturbing emotion derived from the hormones of stress. And their thinking and analyzing was actually making their brain move higher and higher into those beta brainwave patterns. And they were over-focused on something. And so we thought, is there a way to do the opposite? The arousal of those hormones causes us to put all of our attention on the material world. It causes us to become materialists. And when we're materialists and we focus on everything material or that's matter, we start to experience this concept called separation. There's me here and there's you there. And we become confined to the laws of three-dimensional reality. And in separation, when we are matter trying to create an outcome in our life, matter trying to change matter, to produce a change, we have to play by the rules of three-dimensional reality. And that means that everything that we create is going to take time. And the lack and the separation from our dreams or the things we want causes us to rush, causes us to force outcomes, control outcomes, manipulate outcomes, fight for them, compete for them, because that's all we have when we're matter trying to change matter. How many people are with me? And so this concept of separation, if where you place your attention is where you place your energy, and all of your attention and energy is invested in this three-dimensional reality, then because all of your attention and energy is invested in three-dimensional reality and your senses are telling you this is reality, then it, does, makes, it makes complete sense then that most people don't even have an understanding of what energy is. And they have to, they have to work harder to get what they want. And everything takes time and energy. So then they work harder, they have to go to work, to pay the bills, save money, to go on vacation, or to buy the new house, or buy the new car. And it may take 20 years or 30 years for them to get what they want. Because in separation, when we're in three-dimensional reality, we move through space. And as we move through space, this three-dimensional reality, from one point of awareness, Joe Dispenza's here, and the door in the back of the ballroom is the other point of awareness. 
So now I'm going to move from one point of awareness to another point of awareness, and as I move through space, I experience time. Yes or no? And if I want to get somewhere in a shorter amount of time, I just move faster. Yes or no? So then there's me here, and then there's my dreams, the things that I want to create, and my brain automatically puts them where? Way over there. And why does my brain put it there? Because it's going to automatically estimate how long it's going to take for me to pay off whatever I need to pay off to get what I want. And so now I'm separate from my dreams. And there's Joe Dispenza, one point of awareness here, and the dream I'm casting way out into the future over there. And I got to go to that point. And from matter to matter, it's going to take me an enormous amount of time to finally arrive there and a lot of energy. Are you with me still? So when we started studying the brain, we thought, well, okay, everybody's narrowing their focus on the material world. They're over-focusing on things. They're putting their attention on matter, the particle. They're materialists. What if we had them do the exact opposite? What if we had them go from a narrow focus to a broad focus? What if we had them take their attention off everything known and everything material and put their attention on nothing? on energy, on space. And as they began to sense the space around them with their eyes closed, the act of sensing, the act of feeling caused them to stop analyzing and thinking. And all of a sudden, we started to see their brain waves slow down from high beta to mid-range beta. And if we kept them going, it would slow down to low-level beta, and all of a sudden, we would see them move into alpha brainwave patterns. And when they started moving into alpha brainwave patterns, the body started to relax out of that high operating emergency stress mode. And in alpha, they were more creative. They were more imaginative. And they were getting beyond their analytical mind. And one of the reasons we use meditation in this work is to get beyond the analytical mind. And what separates the conscious mind from the subconscious mind is the analytical mind. Are you with me still? So then as they sense the space and they no longer were aware of their environment and we can help them relax, they started to lose track of their body. They no longer felt their body any longer. And all of a sudden, they weren't thinking about the predictable future and the familiar past. They were starting to relax into the present moment. And as they were sensing that space, that, in, that, that nothing, their brains started to integrate. We started to see different communities of neurons in their brain that were once subdivided, beating out of rhythm start to synchronize. Larger communities of neurons began to fire in unison, in cadence. And we started to see the front of the brain start talking to the back of the brain, and the right side of the brain talk to the left side of the brain. And in time, not only were we seeing alpha patterns, but the brain began to restore itself back to wholeness, back to balance, as they opened their focus, and they kept their attention off the material world, off the known. And as they did that, the brain started to synchronize. And what sinks in the brain, links in the brain. And we have seen moments where the two halves of the brain began to fire in psychic union. And when those two sides, the union of polarities, the union of opposites, the union of duality, when the two brains came together and all of a sudden they were firing in wholeness, we would walk around and look at that person right in the real-time brain scan, and there would be tears of joy running down their face because they felt so connected. They felt so whole. They felt so much like themselves again. They felt so integrated that all the feelings of lack and separation went away. Are you with me still? At the same time that that happened, if the person was wearing a heart rate monitor and we were measuring their beats, all of a sudden, we saw the heart start beating in this constant state of cadence. And all of a sudden, when that heart started beating in orderliness, it began to influence the brain. It started to send waves of information 
to the brain, and the brain started to function in more coherence in alpha. And now the brain and the heart started to move into coherence together. And when the heart gets orderly, it begins to produce an external magnetic field that can be up to three meters wide. And now we're starting to feel connected to something. We're starting to feel more whole. And that formula of brain coherence and heart coherence begins to cause us to feel connected to this invisible field of energy called the quantum field. And that unified field of energy is connecting everything physical and material. And Einstein said the field is the sole governing agency of the particle. It's energy that controls matter. He didn't say the particle controls the particle. It's the field that controls the particle. So if we can change the energy in the field, we can change matter or change the particle, yes or no? So if it requires a clear intention and an elevated emotion, if a person is disintegrated and has uh, incoherence in their brain, and they have incoherence in their heart, they would, in a sense, have no energy to connect to the field. They're static. They have no signal, no energy to connect. Are you with me still? When the heart starts beating in rhythm, and it starts beating in order, it's like dropping a pebble after pebble after pebble in a rhythm in a placid lake. And the waves the heart begin to produce is energy or frequency. And the more coherent the heart is, the more orderly it is, the stronger the signal. And if the brain is coherent, then we can lay an intentional thought on that energy. And now we are broadcasting a whole new electromagnetic signature into the field. We started to learn that whatever we broadcast into the field is our experiment with destiny. And the thought tends to be directive. It tends to be the electrical charge. And the feeling then from the heart tends to be the magnetic charge. It tends to draw things back to us. That the thought sends the signal out and the feeling draws the event back to us. And the combination of those two begins to create a Wi-Fi signal that allows us to connect to the unified field. How many people are with me? Does that make sense? So now, you're learning in this audience how to do that. And some of you get frustrated. Some of you think there's something wrong with you because you can't do it. You are learning the process. And the frustration and the impatience is actually driving your brain in the wrong direction. Would you agree? So then if you knew that then, in the midst of your frustration, you could change that. In the midst of your analysis, why isn't this working for me? What's wrong with me? I need a brain scan. Something's wrong with me. Everybody else is getting it but me. That is the only thought you need to get beyond. That emotion of disturbance is the only emotion that you need to get beyond in order for you to experience what I'm talking about. Are you with me still? And when we step into the unknown and we're in the midst of change, it would make sense then to apply that formula to create that kind of brain and heart coherence. And so we activate the heart by placing our attention there. Out of the infinite number of things you can put your attention on, we're asking you to put it right here. This is the center, the creative center, the union of polarity. This is wholeness right here. And once energy makes it to the heart, it goes to the brain. So we start off by activating our heart, and we're teaching our body to feel safe enough in the present moment that our heart could actually open. And if you've protected it for so long, it's going to take a little time to do that. And so we start off in the retreat by putting your attention on it and breathing. And when you slow your breath down, you slow your brain waves down. How do I know that? We've measured it thousands of times. So by you, by volition, inhaling and exhaling and keeping your attention, uh, attention on your heart, you're working with your body to tell it. It's safe enough to create, and by putting your attention on your heart, you are feeding it energy because where you place your attention is where you place your... 
and you're telling it it's okay to come out, it's okay to expand, and it may just take a little while to do that. But if you're feeding it life force with your attention, just like a flower, sooner or later the petals are going to start to open up and begin to bloom. And when the heart feels safe enough to bloom, it starts beating back in rhythm, back in order. How many people are with me? And so to activate our heart, we have to feel heart-centered emotions. This center is the center of kindness, of compassion, of caring. This is the center of inspiration, of appreciation, of gratitude. That in one study, we took 117 people and we asked them to trade the emotions of survival, of fear and anxiety and anger and frustration and sadness for elevated emotions like gratitude. And we asked them to embrace those emotions for 10 minutes a day, three times a day. We measured their cortisol levels and we measured a chemical in the body called immunoglobulin A. IgA. It's your body's primary defense against bacteria and viruses. It's actually stronger and better than any flu shot. And at the end of just four days, by switching those emotions and opening the heart, their IgA levels improved by 50%. 50% the body started moving back into repair. There was energy for the immune system. There was any energy for the cardiovascular system. The autonomic nervous system was moving back into order and balance, and now it had resources for growth and repair. How many people are with me? Does that make sense? So then, when the heart is beating in coherence and there's energy in it and we're breathing in and out and we're opening our hearts, we tend to see possibilities that we didn't see before when we were living with other emotions because those other emotions cause us to view the future through the lens of the past and all we could see is the same. We can't see possibilities. Are you with me still? So then we have research to show that if you practice this as much as complaining <laughs> and you practice it every day, that we have people in this audience that can sustain heart coherence for 45 minutes to an hour at a time. We have, we have research to show that people who do this and they practice it enough times, listen to this, their heart automatically, while they're not even in a meditation, while they're getting ready for bed, they're wearing their heart rate monitor, and we have an hour and 10 minutes of perfect heart coherence. I said to this lady, what in the world were you doing? But I looked at her entire day, and here she is in the first meditation, 40, 45 minutes of perfect heart coherence. The second meditation in the day, 50 minutes of heart coherence. The last meditation of the day, 45 minutes of perfect heart coherence. Eight o'clock at night, she's getting ready for bed, wearing the heart rate monitor, an hour and 10 minutes of heart coherence. I said, well, what happened? She said, I don't know, I was getting ready for bed, and out of nowhere, I had this incredible feeling of love. It was so powerful. It was so intense. I had to lay down and do nothing but feel love. Now, how many people know what a panic attack is. <laughs> yes? How does a panic attack happen? You keep focusing on the worst case scenario in your mind. Yes? And you combine that intention with the emotion of fear. <laughs> Here you go. Stimulus response, thought and feeling. You're conditioning your body emotionally be become the mind of anxiety. Yes or no? Once the body becomes the mind of anxiety, it's going to automatically, without your control, have a panic attack. Try as, you, try as you may to control it with your conscious mind. You can't. You programmed it subconsciously. Well, this person had a spontaneous love attack. She had so much love. Just a state that she was able to feel when she, well, while she wasn't even in the meditation. It was becoming her new state of being. Are you with me still? Now, when that occurs... The heart, as well as the brain, begins to release a chemical called oxytocin. And oxytocin is the love chemical. And just the smallest amount of oxytocin that's released into the bloodstream 
signals nitric oxide. And nitric oxide signals another chemical that causes the arteries in the lungs and the heart to engorge with blood, with energy. Now the heart feels full, it's physiological. And when this center becomes activated, this center is a center of selflessness. This is where we want to give. We want to, we want to consider the whole. We want to make a difference. We want to create. We want to connect. We want to unify. And so the act of giving, imagine this. When, when you feel that feeling where you just have to give, and why are you giving? Because you feel so amazing, you want other people to feel the way you feel, and the only way you can do that is to give them something. Are you with me still? And you're not looking for something back, it's just something you have to do, and when you do it authentically, you release more oxytocin. And when you release more oxytocin, it causes your heart to swell even more, and what do you want to do now? Take care of people, be kind and care. And if you lose your ability to feel that feeling, it's not a problem that you react in your life. The problem is how long you're going to react in your life. And our student body knows how to self-regulate. When they lose that feeling, they're no longer going to stay there for three hours in their day. They're going to say, I know exactly what to do to get back to the emotions of my future and connect to the energy of my future. And now, they're back to the energy of their future, and now they're connected emotionally to that future, and now their body's going to follow their mind into that destiny, or better yet, their future is going to come to them. Are you with me still? So then, learning how to create brain coherence and learning how to create heart coherence can become a skill. And when we study people's brains who can change their brain waves, and their body actually feels so safe that it can completely rest in the present moment, their brain waves slow down into theta brainwave patterns. And now they're very suggestible to information. In other words, that's the moment they can rewrite a new program. That's the moment they can rehearse a new way of being record something new subconsciously and reprogram themselves into a new destiny. Are you with me still? And theta opens the door between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind, and it's a very hypnotic state, and it causes us to be suggestible. And we can auto-suggest and rewrite programs. And that state of theta then causes us to accept, believe, and surrender to the information we're thinking and we can reprogram us to a new destiny. The elevated emotions of gratitude, appreciation, those elevated emotions change the body to such a degree that the body's now programmable. In other words, when you are receiving something favorable, you just receive something favorable, something wonderful is happening to you or something amazing just happened to you, you feel gratitude, yes or no? So the emotional signature of gratitude means something amazing just happened or something amazing is happening to you. So we could say that it is the perfect state emotionally to receive. Yes or no? Yes. So the person who's saying, I'm wealthy, I'm wealthy, I'm wealthy, I'm wealthy, I'm healthy, I'm healthy, I'm healthy, I'm, healthy, I'm, I'm unlimited, I'm limited, and the body's programmed into unhappiness, the body's saying, no, you're not. You're none of those things. And the thought stops at the brainstem and never gets to the body. So then when the person starts to open their heart and allow themselves to feel gratitude, truly grateful, or another way to say it is to get in touch with the emotion that they would feel if their reality happened before it happened. And if they could sustain that state in a state of gratitude, they're suggestible to the information because the body's believing it's already happened. And that thought slips right past the brainstem to the body, and we begin to change our autonomic nervous system. How many people are with me? So then, living in three-dimensional reality, responding and reacting to all the problems and conditions in your life, the redundancy of the response begins to weaken the body, begins to disintegrate the brain. We start to put all of our attention on ma matter, on the particle and quantum physics. And yet, reality is both particle and wave. But we're so habituated into seeing matter that if we can't see our dreams that are right in front of us, then it, they don't exist. 
Are you with me still? And when we are creating from matter to matter, the distance between the thought and the experience, the cause and the effect, that amount of distance is called time. And some people have dreams and goals, but it takes so long for them to happen, they get so distracted that they forget their dreams because it takes too long for them to occur. Are you with me still? So if Einstein said it's not matter that's emitting a field, it's actually the field that's controlling matter, if you could get to that field and create from the field instead of from matter, and energy was influencing matter, if you could get there, is it possible then that you could shorten the distance between cause and effect? Is it possible then, instead of dragging your body through space to get what you want, you actually are the vortex, and now your energy is calling the event to you. And the synchronized energy, because of brain and heart coherence, there's a vibrational match between you and that future. And if the thought is coherent and the feeling is coherent and the thought is the electrical charge and the feeling is the magnetic charge, if you're creating from the field instead of from matter, you no longer have to go anywhere to get what you want. You are the vortex. And now the synchronization begins to cause those opportunities and synchronicities begin to come to you in your life. So the fundamental question is, which would you rather learn how to do? So, let's review a few things here. We call this realm of three-dimensional reality, we call it space-time. And in space-time, in three-dimensional reality, there's an infinite amount of space, yes or no? And because there's an infinite amount of space, we experience time by moving through space. And everything that's physical or material in this world, everything that's matter that we can define with our senses has height and width and depth. And we can say then it is local occupying space and time. And because our senses fool us into the illusion of separation, then there's me here and there's you there, and everything appears separate from me as an individual self. Are you with me still? So in this realm of matter, of density, of form, and structure, in this physical world, we are a body local in an environment or space, and we are experiencing time as a past, present, and future. Yes or no? Yes. And all of our attention as an individual self in one lifetime is on our body, so we have some type of body. We know someone or we are someone. We own some things. We live somewhere, at some places, and in some time. And the identity is identifying with the outer environment. And that is the personality that's trying to create reality. And so what we do then in separation, in matter, local in space and time, is we move through space to get what we want, and it takes time and energy to finally arrive there. Are you with me still? So then, in this realm where there's an infinite amount of space, or space is eternal, <clears throat> the idea of getting something to happen in your life, you have to plan and predict it. And this is the realm of the known. How many people are with me? So then, if we believe that there is an invisible field of energy called the unified field or the quantum field that you can experience with your senses because you only experience this reality with your senses, we started to realize that when people were opening their awareness to nothing and sensing energy or space, they, there came a moment where they had no attention on their body and they went from a somebody to a nobody. When they truly began to create more coherence in their brain, they weren't thinking about anyone or identifying with anyone, and they went from someone to no one. Are you with me still? They no longer were thinking about all the things that they own, their cell phone, their computer, their car. They went from something to nothing. Now, how do you explain nothing to a materialist? Is it blackness? It's a vacuum. It's a void. There's nothing physical there. Are you with me still? They all of a sudden went from somewhere to nowhere. In other words, they weren't even aware that they were sitting in that seat they weren't aware of where they worked. They weren't thinking about where they slept, where they lived. 
And they weren't thinking about the predictable future or their familiar past, and they moved from three-dimensional reality to this concept called time, four-dimensional reality, the eternal present moment, and we call that the eye of the needle. You cannot enter the quantum field with your body. Why? It's physical. It belongs here. You can only enter as pure consciousness. And we call this getting beyond the self. And how many people in this audience are beginning to understand what it truly means to get beyond yourself? So now, if none of your attention is on your body, and your environment is made up of objects and things and other people and other bodies and other places, and you're not thinking about the f predictable future and the familiar past, then you're disinvesting all of your attention, all of your energy out of this three-dimensional reality, taking your attention off of everything known, and you're no longer using your senses to find reality. As you start to slow your brain waves down from beta to alpha, something natural happens, and the memory bank of the known self, the autobiographical self, the artifact of everything you've learned or experienced, you begin to suppress energy or activity in the thinking neocortex. Are you with me still? And if you're disinvesting all of your attention and energy out of this three-dimensional reality off of everything known, and you become pure consciousness, and to change means to be greater than your body, to be greater than your environment, and to be greater than time, the moment you get beyond your body, all the elements in your environment, and time, and you're disinvesting all of your attention in the known, then what else exists except the unknown? Would you agree? And so I have worked for years to teach people how to get beyond themselves. I remember when I first started teaching this concept called space, they were like, what is this guy talking about? You know how many, you know how many hate emails we got? And we don't know what you're talking about this space because it was new. But now look at you now. Do you have any problem opening your awareness into nothing? You actually enjoy it now because the body can move back into homeostasis. It can move back into balance. In fact, so many people, when they finally hit the eye of the needle, the door to the quantum field, when they come back to their senses again, they come back to their identity, their pain is gone. Some condition has changed because they got out of the way and the autonomic nervous system had a moment to do what? It said, okay, he's gone. Looks like we got about 20 minutes. He's made such a mess. Let, let, he's, he's out of the way. Let's, let's make the brain more coherent. That's my job. Let's make the body more in balance. Let's start making the proper hormones. Let's start making the proper enzymes. We got about 10 minutes left before you know who comes back. How many people understand? So then, entering this realm called the quantum, the invisible field of what we call the fifth dimensional reality, if this is the universe, then this is the multiverse. If this is the realm of the known, this is the realm of the unknown, of infinite possibilities, infinite potentials. This is the immaterial. There's nothing material there, the antimatter. This realm, you don't need your senses to define reality. You experience it with your awareness because your consciousness when you enter this realm. Are you with me still? Hello? Yeah. And if this is the realm of separation, then this is the realm of connection. This is oneness, wholeness, unity. There is no separation. Your consciousness, when you enter this place, is actually immersed in another consciousness, and there is no separation. So if there is no separation between two points of consciousness, then there is no time. Are you with me still? So then if there is no time because there is no space there, hello, then the distance between cause and effect would be immediate. Yes or no? In other words, the thought would create the experience instantaneously because you're connected. You're the consciousness of everybody, of everyone, of everything, of everywhere and every time. You're the all in all. And this is the realm of frequency, of energy, of vibration. And frequency carries information, carries thoughts, it's consciousness, it's intention. And every thought in this realm has a frequency. And so then, in this place, there's nothing physical. Everything exists non-locally as a potential. Are you with me still? Come on. So, so many people, when they start moving into this, into this realm, they have a subconscious belief 
that they haven't faced off with that they still think they're their body in this realm. How many people have come up against that when I say, let go and become it? If you're your body, you're like, well, what do you mean? I'm a body here. I'm, there's me here, and then there's nothing here. But this is the realm of thought, and every thought has a frequency. And in this realm, time is eternal. There's an infinite amount of time. There's so much time, the eternal now says you can get anything done you want to. And if you have infinite amount of time to get anything done, how many possibilities you have? Equal to your ability to imagine. And so then, there is no past and there is no future. That happens in linear time here. Past, present, and future are all existing when? Now, now in the eternal present moment. And all of a sudden, when people move consciously out of their neocortex, and they start, we start seeing energy move into the limbic brain, and they start feeling these elevated emotions. The elevated emotions is causing them to feel less separation and more wholeness, yes or no? And as they feel those elevated emotions, do they want time to end, or do they want time to be elongated? And so as they feel these elevated emotions of ecstasy and bliss and joy and this incredible sense of grace, they don't want the moment to end. They want to elongate the moment. And as they elongate the moment, they're moving closer and closer to what? Connection to oneness, to pure love. That's where we came from. Are you with me still? So it makes sense then, the more elevated the emotion the person feels, the more connected they are to the unified field then, the shorter amount of time it should take for it to appear in their life. Are you with me still? So then, within an infinite amount of time, and there is no space, there's none of this. Come on. Every thought then has a vibration or a frequency. Yes or no? And so then, you move from one point of consciousness or one point of awareness to another point of awareness. The faster you move, the shorter amount of time it takes, right? Hello? But here, you're connected to everything, everyone, everything. There's no place to go. You are connected to source, to singularity, to pure energy. The only thing you can do is change your thought. And by changing your thought, the more elevated the thought, the faster the frequency. Are you with me still? So then we change our thoughts. By changing our thoughts, we create different frequency. So there is a potential for abundance, yes or no? How many potentials are there for your abundance? Because every new one you think of means that there's infinite ones from that one. Are you with me still? And these dimensions then, these possibilities, all exist in the present moment. And as we change our vibration, change our thoughts, we can move through time. We can time travel and experience different dimensions that exist past, present, and future. Are you with me still? So then, when we're creating from the field instead of from matter, and we are connected to the all-in-all -all source, if you are creating from source, then you are no longer praying to source. You are creating as source. And if the unified field is an invisible field of energy that connects everything physical or material, and you swam upstream all the way to singularity, why would you go anywhere if there's nowhere to go in, in time space? Clear intention, coherent brain, elevated emotion, coherent heart, thoughts sending the signal out, feeling drawing the event back, you feeling connected to that unified field. Now, you are the magnet to your destiny. Now there's a synchronization of energy, and that synchronization then begins to call the experience to you, and it will come in a way that you least expect. Why? Because if you can expect it, it's the known. You can predict it, it's the known. It comes in a way that you, you least expect. It's unpredictable. It surprises you. It catches you off guard, and it shows you then that your thoughts and feelings are beginning to produce some kind of outcome in your life. And the moment you correlate the changes you made inside of you with the effect you produced outside of you, you're going to pay attention to what you did, and you're going to do it again. And you're going to start believing now more that you're the creator of your life and less of the victim of your life. How many people understand? So now, let's uh, go to the PowerPoint here. Take a look at this. 
You want something in your life. This is three-dimensional creation. Let's say you wanted wealth. You got to go get it, yes or no? You want health? You better make sure you eat the right foods and move your body around a lot. You want freedom? You got to make a lot of choices to get there. It takes time. Would you agree? You want love? You got to go on Match.com and you got to look at a lot of body parts to get there. You want genius? You got to read a lot of books. You got to study a lot of information to get there. And all of this takes time. Why? Because you have to drag your body through space in three-dimensional reality. And that future exists separate from you. And you got you to get your body to it in time. How many people are with me? So here's point A, one point of awareness. And we're going to go to point B. Whoops. <laughs> and moving from point A to point B is going to take a certain amount of time because you are going to move through space. Yes or no? All right. Next slide. Now, from fifth dimensional reality, you are the source. You are the magnet. You don't go get wealth. Wealth comes to you. You create health from the field. Energy influencing matter. An opportunity shows up in your world. You don't create it matter to matter. Love, you have a vibrational match, it comes to you. You get downloads from, your, from the field into your brain. We see what that looks like on a scan. <laughs> you are going to be enlightened, filled with new light and information. And it can happen in no time. Now check this out. Whatever that thing is, Mr. Lego Man, Look, he's not even in the plane, or she, or whatever that is. Look! Drawing the experience to you. He did not go anywhere. It came to him. Are you still with me? All right, now check this out. Coherent brain, the thought sends the signal out. You got that, yes? Now, we got to get the creative center involved. It's mind and body, you got to do both. If you combine that clear intention with an elevated emotion, your heart has a magnetic field. It is readable with a magnetometer. The event draws the experience back to you. Combine the clear intention with the elevated emotion, and what do you have? One signal going out and the other come back, and you create a standing wave, and time stands still into the eternal present moment and the door opens to the unknown, to possibilities. Are you with me still? Watch it again. Do it again, Andrew. So it would be a good idea to have a coherent brain. Would you agree? Because a coherent brain is a clear signal. That's a clear signal out. The elevated emotion draws the event back. The interference of both of those simultaneously opens the door to the present moment, to the unknown. Now you are the magnet to your destiny, and you can draw the experience to you. If you're connected to source, to the unified field, and you're creating, why would you go anywhere? Your source, it comes to you. You got it? All right, so if you combine a clear intention, you have the intentional thought of abundance. You're sending that thought out. And you make your mind movie, and abundance means a car to you, or a house, or whatever, whatever it is, the dream. You got it? Your mind movie does that, yes? all the symbols to remind you of your future. You combine that with an elevated emotion, and some people say, well, I don't know the emotion I should feel. Well, gratitude would be a good one to start with, don't you think? If you feel gratitude, your body's believing it's happening to you when? And if you... ...freedom, and you feel inspired, and you feel joy, you're activating this center. So the clear intention with the elevated emotion manifests destiny. And all of a sudden, you start to have opportunities, things starting to come to you instead of you going to get them. Now, which would you prefer? How many people understand this? Does this make sense? So how do you then explain a synchronicity. What is that? 
When you are thinking about something or you are in the process of imagining something, the number one thing that happens to you is you change your energy. Some people, all of a sudden, they're exposed to new information. They see a, a documentary on quantum physics and mind and whatever, and they're kind of mystified by the whole thing. And on some level, they say, oh, I've always thought that way. And all of a sudden, they start feeling inspired. They start thinking about futures, and they start, it, the new information is creating more light and information to be emitted. And all of a sudden, they start changing their energy. And when you change your energy, change your life. And all of a sudden, they start getting feedback. But then they stop learning, and they go back to those familiar feelings, and everything returns back to the same. So would you agree with me then, the more knowledge you have, the more inspired you get about possibilities, the more you change your energy? Yes or no? So then it is possible then, by creating from the field, instead of from matter, and creating a coherent signal in the field, and drawing that experience back to you in your heart, if meditation means to become familiar with, is it possible that if you could lock into that energy every day and you knew that your heart was coherent and you knew how to create those changes in brain waves and create brain coherence, is it possible then if you practiced it, I don't know, let me swing out here, two weeks, tuning into that energy of your future, if you keep practicing it over and over again, will it begin to become familiar to you? And when you are not in the energy of your future, would you recognize you feel differently? And then you could say, which emotion do I like living in? This one or this one? And you could make the choice then, if you believe that you were the creator of your life, to excuse yourself for a few moments and make the change so you're back to connecting to the energy of your future. And if you practice doing that enough times, when there's a vibrational match between you and that future and the ex experiences are happening to you and the synchronicities start off as small, but the experience of the synchronicity creates the excitement, the inspiration, the change in your energy, the surprise. And you all of a sudden use that energy for what? The next meditation. And all of a sudden you say, you know, you're the person saying, well, I really couldn't feel anything in the beginning. Now, you can't stop feeling it because your environment's giving you feedback to inspire you that you're actually a creator. The next question is, why would you miss a day? Why would you miss a day if the magic was happening to you? You would want to keep practicing, yes or no? So now, this meditation, synchronizing your energy to synchronicities, I, I love doing this uh, personally. I love remembering the feeling of my future. I, re I love getting in my heart and feeling what it would feel like. And when I get there, I keep saying to myself, remember this feeling. Why am I saying that? Because it's easier to forget it in the beginning than to remember it. And I practice sometimes when I'm in my car, practice when I'm in a staff meeting listening to people talk. I thought, what the hell? I might as well just tune in, see if I can bring it up on command with my eyes open. And then I think, well, hell, I'm, what if it really happened? What would, I, what would I really feel? And I take it to the next level. Why am I taking it to the next level? Because after a while, it's no longer going to be about the event. It's not going to be about your wealth. It's not going to be about your new relations. It's going to be the fact that you created it. And that's the part where you fall more in love with yourself. And when you fall, fall more in love with yourself, you fall more in love with life. And all of a sudden now, it's easier to create because now you have the change in your chemistry. So then, when you stop doing the work, we've seen this so many times, people stop doing the work. They stop doing the work because they start reacting to their environment once again. And they fall back into the unconscious program. Their responses to everyone and everything in their environment is greater than the way they're changing their internal state. And they just don't feel like changing. And when we use feelings as a barometer for change, we'll always talk ourselves out of possibility. We'll slip back into those familiar feelings and find other people that are doing the exact same thing and have a, a relationship 
based on those emotions and the agreements that go along with them. Are you with me still? So now, in this meditation, we have to activate the heart before we start creating. Would you agree? And imagine then, for those of you that are still having difficulty, imagine the feeling that you would feel if whatever it is that you're working on happened. And if you could open your heart and feel that feeling in your heart, is it possible then that when that feeling is greater than the feeling of your past, listen closely, and your body can finally find the sweet spot of the present moment, the unknown, and the feelings bringing you closer and closer to unity, to wholeness, your reunion to source and less separation. Is it possible then that feeling, if you were so in that feeling that you wouldn't want the moment to end, you would want to elongate it, that time would stand still and your body, as the objective mind, would start to believe it was living in that future reality when? In the present moment. And if the environment signals the gene, give me a nod, and the end product of an experience in the environment is the emotion, you're actually signaling the gene ahead of the environment. And genes make proteins. And proteins are responsible for the structure and the function or physiology of your body. And the expression of proteins is the expression of life. You begin to become that person that you're imagining. And your body is starting to look like, neurologically, neurochemically, hormonally, genetically, it's already happened. And this is where you get to relax, because the event is going to find you. How many people understand? So we activate the heart. Take a big, take a big step with your heart. Just take a chance. Just open it and fall in love. Those of you who are saying, What's, I can't do this, I'm doing something wrong. What are you doing wrong is you're not letting go. Just let go and have fun and feel. Those of you who have problems changing your brain with, what do you do when you go to bed? Don't you just stop thinking? There's blackness, and the next thing you know, you're gone. I want you to do that exact same thing, but I want you to do it sitting up, but instead of falling all the way in the delta, just keep relaxing slower and slower. And if you start revving up, pause, slow down, and just keep going down. Are you with me still? So then, once we start by activating the heart, I'm going to take you on a journey, and I'm going to ask you then to sense the endless space, the infinite vacuum way out beyond you, on both sides of you, behind you. And as you sense nothing, as you reach out and tune in to all the blackness, all I want you to do is pay more attention to it and less attention to you. Can you do that? And we're not going to do it yet. Just hang on there. Come on, don't run, don't run away yet. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing it? Tell me. For brain coherence. Yes? That's the signal we're going to send out. The more coherent the brain, the more the signal can ride. You got it? So I'll take you deep in there, and I'll ask you to become nobody. What do I mean when I say become nobody? Take all of your attention off your body. Stop thinking about hunger. Stop thinking about pain. Stop thinking about your bladder. Stop itching yourself, whatever it is. Just get beyond that. Disinvest your attention out of this three-dimensional reality. When I tell you to become no one, what do I mean by that? Stop identifying with all the people in your life. You shouldn't be thinking of anyone. When I say nothing, take your attention off of everything physical. So if we took away everything physical in the universe, from the planets to the moons, to the sun, to the stars, to the light from the sun and the stars, the galaxies, what would you be left with? Nothing. It's just an empty vacuum, yes? So when I say nothing, if I say blackness, I mean it's a vacuum. You got it? There's research out of Princeton University that actually shows that this is the truth. If you're not thinking about where you're sitting, and th where you're sitting actually disappears, where you live, where you work, or, or, where you sleep, you're no longer thinking of a place. You're in nowhere. Would you agree? And if you're not thinking about the predictable future and the familiar past, and you get beyond time, you're not thinking about how long the music's going to go, what's going to happen next, your brain is not anticipating the next moment, you're present, then you're in no time. Yes or no? 
And that's the moment you disinvest all of your attention and energy out of the three-dimensional reality off the known, and now you're looking for some unknown experience, and you're passing through the eye of the needle as pure consciousness. And now your consciousness is closer to the unified field and less in separation. Are you with me still? Now, if I asked you once you got there to tune in, remember, every thought has a... Is the thought of oneness existing here? Hello? And does the thought of oneness have a frequency? If I ask you to tune in to the thought or the frequency of the thought of oneness, could you find it? Could you feel it? Could you pay attention to it? Could you become more of it and less of you and lose your sense of separation as a self, an individual, and emerge, merge with oneness? And if you were merging with oneness, would there be any separation between you and oneness? You would have to completely let go and feel more of it and less of you and don't look back to see how far you came. Just keep falling into it. Keep surrendering more. Keep letting go. Now we start to connect to this field. And when your consciousness is emerge, emerges or, or um, merges with a greater consciousness and there's no separation any longer, then there should be less distance between cause and effect because the thought will create the experience in oneness. Are you with me still? Why? Because there's no separation, because there is no space. And if there is no space, there is no... And it happens when? So then we'll get there, and then we are going to tune in to three different things that all are related to one thing. So, for example, if you wanted abundance, I was telling the group this earlier, most people want abundance, but what they really want is freedom, right? So if we tune into abundance, and I say tune into the thought, the frequency of the thought of abundance, could you find it? Hello? Could you feel it? And if I let you latch on to that thought and you stayed connected to it, and I said to you, now draw it to you with your heart. Could you put your attention on your heart? And I keep saying to you, drawing it to you with your heart, if your heart was the magnet, could you just stay in your heart and feel the emotion? The longer you're feeling that energy in and around your heart, the more you're calling it to you. The longer you're conscious of this energy, the more you're drawing it to you. Could you do that? And I'll just allow you to do that for a period of time, and then I'll say, now tune in to the frequency of freedom. Oh, find it, feel it, fall in love with it, stay connected to it. Once you're sending that signal out with a coherent brain, what are you going to do next? I'm creating from the field. I'm creating from source. I'm going to bond with it with my heart, and you are going to draw the experience to you with your heart. I'm going to say, feel it within you, and... Now, you're not going to feel that frequency here. You're going to feel it right here. You've been training, and all I want you to do is tune in, and I'm going to say the longer you're conscious of this energy, the more you're calling it to you. And if you're creating from the field, you are synchronizing your energy and calling it to you. Are you with me still? And I always finish number three with an opportunity. So no matter what you're deciding to do, we'll always finish with an opportunity. Tune in to the frequency of an opportunity. Does it exist for you? Does the divine in you know already what your best opportunity would be? Of course it does. It's connected to everyone, everything, everywhere, every place. Everyone. It already knows what, it's, what the solution is. So then tuning into the opportunity then, drawing the opportunity to your heart would bring an opportunity closer to you, yes or no? If you wanted health, what people really want when they want health is they want wholeness. So we'll tune into the frequency of health, tune into the frequency of wholeness, tune into the frequency of opportunity. You got it? If you wanted love, most people want to be in love because they want to enjoy life with someone else. So if you wanted love, you tune into the frequency of love. That shouldn't be too hard for some of you. Tune into the frequency of joy. Tune into the frequency of opportunity. And each one of those will draw the experience to us with our heart. Remember the animations? Now, when it happens and how it happens is none of your business. Because the moment you try to predict what's going to happen, you are laying a known over an unknown, and 
we honor free will, and now you can do it matter to matter. You just disconnected. How many people understand? If you wanted a mystical experience, I used to do this all the time. I tune into the frequency of the mystical. It's a wonder. It's a curiosity. It's, a, it's an excitement about something new, of an unknown. You tune into that frequency, but what is, what is, a, what is the feeling? What is the reason you're doing that? You want to be in awe, like, like you can't wipe the smile off your face, or you're just looking around going, is anybody else feeling this awesome feeling? You're just blessed by something that is so outside of your neurological networks. I mean, I've had some of those that have taken me months to put in the words. I don't know what that was. I couldn't even find the words for it. You want one of those? That feeling of awe is what wakes us up. And if you tuned in to opportunity, then of course you would begin to synchronize your energy to an opportunity. We'll go through three of those. Now, can you pick something or something that you want and organize it into those th three things? Last one being opportunity and the other two something personal. Hello. Am I talking too fast? You understand, yes? So you have something in mind, yes? You could actually just tune in to synchronicities, imagine that, and be worthy because that's just part of your life and tune into opportunities, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I was just thinking of you. What do you know? Get over here. Yeah, let's do it. So then, after we tune in, I'll say, lay your body down. Now, for those of us that are in the room, I'll let you drift off for a period of time, and then I'll bring you back to allow our autonomic nervous system to integrate all this information neurologically, neurochemically, hormonally, genetically, body needs time to consolidate all this information, so we let it rust. Those of you that are on the live stream, we'll just allow the music to play, and whenever you decide to come back um, in the comfort of your own home or someone else's home, uh, you come back when you're ready. We'll just let the music play. How does that sound? Want to try it out? All right, so you have your things, yes? Do I have your word? If you're in this meditation, you're in it the entire time. Can you please shut off your cell phones? I don't want any distractions for you. And by the way, this is not hard. You already know how to do this. Just pretend like you know what you're doing. See what happens then. <clears throat> Watch is off. Glass is off. Sit up and get comfortable. Sit up. Eyes closed. Take a breath. And relax. Your body. The divine lives in you. In your sacred heart. Find it. Feel it. Fall in love with it. Your heart. Feel into your heart. And awaken to love. Feel it. In 
your heart. That's energy. In your heart. And breathe life into your heart. And exhale. And feel into your heart. And inhale life your heart and exhale let a little more life to your heart feel it and breathe and feel your heart and breathe feel that's energy in your heart feel it Notice it. Experience it with your heart. Feel it. Be moved by it. Fall in love with it. Your heart. And breathe and feel. And awaken your heart. That's energy. In your heart. That's life. In your heart. And breathe and feel. Relax into your heart. Feel it within you. And all around you. Tune in to life of your heart. Find it feel it. your heart. Experience it. Tune in and receive.
It's within you. And all around you. Feel it. energy to create with your heart and relax into nothing. the endless beyond you. go deep is endless space
sense it. Become more aware of it. Pay more attention to it. Less attention to you. Feel your connection to it. To nothing. Stay there. Become aware. Beyond you. It's behind you. Sense it. Notice it. Feel your connection to it. Aware of it. To nothing. Behind you.
Feel it. Stay connected to it. Become more aware of it. Nothing Tune in Relax. Into nothing. More. Dissolve. Like a drop of water.
to an endless black sea. And be calm. Feel it. Experience it. Surrender to it. realm beyond space and time. Of all thoughts, of infinite frequencies, tune in to the frequency of the thought of oneness. Find it. Feel it. Feel 
feel your connection to it. to it. with it. Now tune in to the frequency of your first Possibility, the thought. Stay connected to it. Feel it. Feel its vibration. Stay connected to it. Feel it. Moment. Stay connected to it from the field. It's time to draw it to you. energy in your heart. Tune in with your heart. Drawing it to you.
no longer you're conscious of this energy. Within you, your heart. And all around you, connect to that experience. The energy of your heart. Drawing it to you. With your heart. Synchronizing your energy. feeling with your heart. Drawing it to you from the field. With your heart. That's energy. Remember this feeling in your heart. Let that future live in your heart. Know it. My heart. Nothing. Feel it. Stay connected to it.
noticing. Stay connected to it. Stay present with it. Become it. Feel it. Feel your connection to it. Information into the feed. Time to draw it to you with your heart. Drawing it to you. With your heart. Feel your connection to it. Tune in to the energy of your future. Be in bond with this. With your heart. Within you. Feel your connection to it. With your heart. Drawing it to you. With your heart. Longer your con. 
conscious of this energy. The more you draw it to you with your heart. Tune in to the energy of your future. Drawing it to you with your heart. Feel it. The energy of your future. In your heart. Let your future live in your heart. Know it. By heart. Remember this feeling. It's your connection to your future. A new energy in your heart. In nothing. Now tune in to the frequency of the thought, of the opportunity. An opportunity. Find it. Become aware of it. Stay connected to it. Become it. Become. feeling the frequency of opportunity feel it notice it Stay connected to it. Experience it. Relax into it. Become it. Feel your connection to it.
tune in to the opportunity in the unknown. Stay aware of it. Sending the signal radiating into the feed. Feel it. Stay present with it. Sending the signal. Into the field. Sense it. The frequency of the thought. Of the perfect opportunity. Synchronize in your energy. Coherent message, information. Feel it. Time to draw it to you. With your heart. Feel your connection to it. With your heart. Drawing it to you. With your heart. Within you, and all around, connect to the energy of an opportunity with your heart. Feel it. Stay connected to it. Drawing it to you. With your heart. Tune in. With your heart. Drawing it to you. With your heart. Feel your connection to it. With your heart. In nothing.
drawing it to you. Feel your connection to it. In your heart. Tune in and draw it to you with your heart. opportunity is within you and all around tune in drawing it to you with your heart longer you're conscious of this energy, the more you draw it to you, feel it with your heart. Feel your connection to it. With your heart. Let the opportunity Live in your heart. Remember this feeling. Know it by heart. Synchronizing your energy for synchronicities in your life. Change your energy. Change your life. For whatever you broadcast into the feed, Is your experiment with destiny. And if by chance we created as source instead of separate to source. that we are open to opportunities that come in ways that we least expect, that surprise us, the unknown, that leave no doubt that it came from a greater mind so that we're 
inspired to create again, again, and again. That we are worthy Take a breath and relax. Your body notice its weight. laying beneath you on the ground. Soften your joints. while you stay slightly awake. Feel it all at once. Feel it. Drift away. And 
to the feeling. Stay open. They're all around you. 